this is the end. That's what I thought when I was standing with only my heels on an edge of concrete 50 feet above the ground at 15 years old. This is the end. I can't do this anymore. I'd been here before to that place. I came to that place because I related to it. As I stood out over that edge at about midnight on a March night, it was a Sunday night, it was cold, there was still snow on the ground, not that different from right now. And I looked out over the landscape in front of me, and it was an abandoned steel plant. I grew up in Sydney, Nova Scotia. Off to my right-hand side, as I had my arms on the railing behind me, was the community that I had grown up in, a working-class, poor community, one ravaged by unemployment and depression. To my right was the rest of the city. Now, Sydney was a city of about 25,000 people or so, not a small town, but not a big city either. But I felt tiny there. Because for the last at least six years prior to that point, I'd been struggling with depression, with anxiety, with suicidal thoughts. In fact, I had already been hospitalized half a dozen other times before that. And I related to this place, like most suicide hotspots actually in the world, the Bloor Street Viaduct used to be the number two suicide hotspot in North America before they built the Luminous Veil. Vale. The Golden Gate Bridge is still the number one, but they've recently announced that they're building a barricade there too. We didn't have anything like that in Sydney at the time almost two decades ago. There were no signs, there were no help, phone, uh, help lines, there was nothing like that. There was just this abandoned steel plant out in front of me. And I related to that place because I felt like over the last few years, I had been struggling. I had been struggling since at least 10 years old, 9 or 10 years old, an elementary school student who wasn't allowed to talk about his emotions. It wasn't manly. Be a man. That's what my stepfather told me all the time. But as I looked out over this abandoned steel plant, it was this place that had once had so much livelihood, so much vitality, so much energy. It had provided so much to everybody, and here it was empty and falling down and alone. And that's how I felt inside. I didn't have a person to relate to to get that feeling, but this place did. Now, this place had provided the livelihood for my whole family and generations before them. That's why they all moved there in the first place. My mother was one of, uh, <laughs> one of 16 kids. My father was, was one of 15. We, we were Irish Catholic, so... <laughs> That should explain everything. Be fruitful and multiply. Yeah, even God was like, Agnes, slow down. <laughs> That's too much. Um, it meant that in a small town like Sydney, Nova Scotia, when, we went, when I finally got to high school and we'd go to a dance or start dating somebody, you always had to run through the family tree real quick just to see if you were related. And you were usually okay. I mean, it's only illegal up to like second cousins, so it's fine. <laughs> That's a different talk. <laughs> it happens to everybody. Is what, never mind. Um, it's the type of small town where everything's still closed on Sundays and pretty much after five. There wasn't much to do, so in the evenings, people would listen to the police scanner to see if anybody was getting in trouble, you know, to hear the police chatter on the radio. So that way they could talk about them over their double-double the next morning at Tim Hortons. There was nothing else to do. They didn't have to go to work. But one of the things that people didn't really talk about in those times, or at least not to the people who were struggling, were things like depression and anxiety and how you were feeling, especially for a kid, especially for a little boy. At least they didn't talk to me about those things. And every time I had expressed a desire to talk, I wanted to talk about how I was feeling, I felt like it was shut down. People weren't ready for that kind of conversation. I wanted to talk, but it seemed like nobody wanted to listen. And when you get that message so many times, you learn that it's not safe to talk. Before I got to the edge of that bridge, it's not like it had come out of nowhere. On my very first hospital admission, I, I pulled all my medical records within the last two years or so for a new book that I'm writing that's out later this year. 
And if you ever want to know what, like, a really honest, unvarnished picture of yourself, read what your therapist writes about you, <laughs> or your doctor. <laughs> and that ad admitting nurse on that very first visit, she re I was reading through the ad admission notes, and it said in the uh, medical history section of the admission form, no prior mental health history, no prior psych history. That was in April of the year 2000, and that was, the, that was the last time my medical records would ever say that. And in the family interview section, my mother had brought me to the hospital, and they had some quotes from the interview that they conducted with my mother, and they said, my mother said to them, we didn't see this coming. Mark is a good boy. As though being a good boy and having a hard time are two mutually exclusive things. The next time I went to hospital after another attempt, because that's still how the mental health system works and not a lot of people appreciate that. You get into a crisis, you go to hospital, the crisis comes down. You get released, but you're not, you're not given any tools to actually carry out of that place with you. So the second time when I was admitted, I remember I was in the basement psych ward at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital. That's where all the best psych wards are, in the cinder block windowless basement. <laughs> where they take your shoelaces, they have double locked doors, and I was sharing a room with an older man because we didn't have child and youth mental health services in our small town. And in fact, many small towns don't, and they still don't there. We were, I was sharing a room with a, a man who was much, much older than me, at least 40 years older than me, and he had very different needs than I did, because we didn't have specialized mental health care there either. And I remember that very first night that we were uh, both asleep. I was in the bed under the window, he was in the bed by the door. It was about four in the morning, he would sit, bolt upright in his bed, and just start screaming, WE WILL OVERCOME! And then he'd go back to sleep. <laughs> And I'd be wide awake thinking, what the hell is this? I didn't sign up for this. Is this where I'm supposed to get better? I'm not crazy. All the other attempts that led to the bridge that night became increasingly more outward, increasingly more obvious, increasingly more articulated. Because it turns out that people aren't just born knowing how to kill themselves. They're not born deep in the pit of depression and anxiety. You start out at the rim, and then you spiral down. And without enough help, without enough intervention, without somebody to intervene, interrupt that spiral, you'll keep going. It's not the kind of thing that a kid grows out of. It's not just another phase. That it requires an intervention to pull them out of that whirlpool. I had been spiraling down, and by the time I got to the bottom of the pit and I stood on that inch and a half of concrete, on that old overpass that stretched over the abandoned steel plant, the only place where I felt like I could, could relate, I had climbed over the railing, holding the telephone pole on my left-hand side because I had fallen so deep into this whirlpool that when I climbed over the railing to kill myself, I didn't want to slip and fall by accident. <laughs> I felt like I had no control over anything in my life, but this I could control. People had taken away my agency, they had strapped me down, they had medicated me, they had put me in locked rooms and cells, and that was all fine, if not for the people who wouldn't talk to me anymore. The people who looked at me differently when I walked in the room. The teachers who didn't take me seriously. The feeling that I had let down my parents. When I stood on that edge, People sometimes think, how can somebody who's suicidal do that to the people that they love? How can they be so selfish to hurt the people that they love like that? I was thinking about the people that I loved. I thought I'd be doing them a favor. I thought I'd be saving my mother the trouble that was me. Because as a person with a mental illness, according to the media, according to the newspapers and television, that means I'm going to be a, an axe murderer, right? That I'm going to be violent. I'm going to be a rapist or an arsonist. I mean, I've watched Law and Order. 
It turns out people with mental illnesses are no more likely to be violent than the average population. Actually, in fact, they're far, far, far more likely to themselves be victims of violence than to ever be perpetrators. And when they do perpetrate violence, it's almost always against themselves in the form of self-harm and suicide. But that's not the message that we get. More than 80% of media reports that mention the keyword mental illness or mental health also mention violence in some capacity. The impact that that has, the stigma that creates, is not just a matter of discussion. It's a matter that actually internal, that we, that people who are struggling internalize that stigma. We feel like the world would be better off without us. It's not true, but it's what we believe. So what's the difference? I was standing on the edge for I don't know how long, because time does funny things. Your world gets fuzzy when you're in this kind of place. If you've ever experienced this, I gave this example in, in my TED talk too, where you're cut off in traffic, and it's a really stupid, violent, you know, dangerous thing that happens, and in that moment, your whole focus zooms in. The blinders go on, the perception collapses into that moment to keep you safe. That's evolutionarily what your mind is supposed to do. But then, eventually, your mind relaxes. You come back out of that moment. Maybe you flip the guy off, or you curse, or you roll down your window. It, nobody rolls down their window anymore, but anyway. <laughs> but you usually go on with your life. You usually get over it, right? Except when the problem is with the, the part of your mind that focuses, the part of your mind that, that zooms in or out on these kinds of problems, and it gets stuck there then it's not so easy to snap out of it. It's not so easy to move on. You wouldn't tell a person with two broken legs, oh, just walk it off. <laughs> I don't know how long I was standing on that edge, but I was feeling that sense of control that I finally had a choice in my life. And then I was interrupted. And really quite unexpectedly so, because I had planned this to the detail. I knew where I wanted to go, I knew when I wanted to go, and it was all with the objective of not getting caught again. I went there alone late at night because I wanted to die alone. I felt like all these professionals, all these doctors and nurses and teachers and OTs and social workers and psychologists and friends and parents, none of them could help me. And if all these really smart people can't help me, maybe I'm the problem. Maybe it's not the system. Maybe the system isn't broken. Maybe I'm broken. And I'm unfixable. I was interrupted by a voice, though, that, that pierced that whirlpool of negative thoughts, those lies that my depression was telling me. And it wasn't very insightful. It wasn't, it wasn't suddenly somebody said something that snapped me out of it. It was a man's voice over my right shoulder, and he said, you don't look like you're doing so good there. <laughs> and I couldn't see him. He walked up slowly behind me. I could see that he was a good distance away, well past my arms that were still stretched out on the railing. And all that I could see was that he was wearing a light brown corduroy or, or, or canvas jacket. Um, he probably introduced himself, but when you're still so zoomed tight in on that one thing, this is what I had to do. I had to end my life. And I never wanted to die. That wasn't the point. That's, that's a, a, an unfortunate side effect of killing yourself, is dying. Really what I wanted to do was not live like that anymore. Not live with all that stuff inside me anymore. And I had no idea how else to do it. So when I was focused in on that thing, he probably introduced himself. But then he started to talk to me about my life. He didn't ask me about my diagnosis, which by that point was major depressive disorder and social anxiety disorder, with maladaptive coping patterns, as you might imagine. He didn't ask me about my medications. I'd been on about eight by that time antidepressants, antipsychotics, anti-anxiety medications, hypnotics for sleep, anti-seizure medications, because sometimes they can be prescribed off-label for other things too. 
Different medications stacked in different ways. Some made me much worse. None of them made, really made me all that much better. But he didn't care. He didn't ask me about which doctors I had seen. I had seen many. He didn't ask me about what therapies I had done. I had done many. He asked me about my cat. <laughs> he asked me if I had any other pets. He asked me if I had any hobbies. I told him I liked to play guitar. I was just learning. He liked to play guitar too. We had that in common, so we chatted a bit about that. He asked me about my parents and my friends, my family, all 32 plus aunts and uncles that we know of. He asked me what I was passionate about and what I liked to do, what I was interested in. And it was such an unusual situation for me at that time because I felt like, as the broken one, everybody had been trying to fix me. That I had been depersonalized. I was a project, I was a machine, and we just needed to get in there and tinker some things around in his brain, find the right combination of chemicals, and everything will be fine. Nobody else had asked me about my cat. <laughs> and it was strange enough for me that in retrospect, although I wouldn't have said that at the time, I could feel myself loosening up. I could feel my focus broadening from that one thing that I needed to do. Because I needed to have this conversation with this man who was just getting to know me. It broadened out my, my perception enough that I realized that the police had arrived. I didn't hear them, and there were a lot of them, so I don't know how I didn't hear them. But when I looked to either side, I could still only see the stranger in the light brown jacket from a sidelong view. I couldn't see his face. And beyond him, I could see the yellow sawhorse barricades that had been set up on either side of the bridge. And police cars had arrived, two on one side, three on the other. I could see the back of an ambulance, just the corner of it behind me. And crowds had gathered, even though it was after midnight on a Sunday night in March. Because when there's not much to do in a small town like Sydney, Nova Scotia, sometimes people listen to the police scanner, see if there's any action happening, and they can go check it out. I could hear them talking, chattering on the sides, at least I thought I could, but then again, it could have just been in my head. But I could swear I heard a small group of young men on the right-hand side, close to the railing of the bridge, about 15 feet away, laughing. There were three of them. One of them yelled out to me. From the sidelines, he yelled, Jump, you coward. In that moment, the whirlpool spun again. The collapse happened again. And it didn't matter that I had this perfect stranger in the light brown jacket standing behind me, getting to know me, pulling me out, loosening me up. This other stranger on the sidelines decided, to not do that, to not know my story, to not care, to not connect. And when that happened, the triggers had, becoming, had been becoming increasingly trivial over the years. That was all I needed. In that tenuous little balance, everything collapsed again. I forgot everybody around me. The police and barricades and crowds disappeared. I let go over the railing, and as soon as I did, I started to fall. As I fell, and I was looking down, I saw the stranger's light brown jacket wrap around my chest, his arm, and his hand grabbed the back of my coat. When he pulled me back against the railing, which was at about my mid-back, my feet flew up off of the edge, and I was dangling over the side. He pulled me over the railing, and I was loaded into the ambulance. He later told police, that my body had gone completely limp, that I had just given up. When I went to the hospital that night, back to the basement psych ward, nothing really changed. I saw all the same doctors. They all knew me by name. I tried all the same medications. They kept me for a few days and released me. In the discharge form, they said, just leave Mark's file open. He'll probably be back. <laughs> I had gone from being, we never saw this coming, boy, to becoming a frequent flyer, as we affectionately call them, of the mental health system. Nothing changed for me that night in terms of my care, but something very subtle changed in my mind. 
of all the things that my focus had pathologically locked onto over the years, for some reason, it locked onto the image of these two men who were with me that night. One of them, the stranger in the light brown jacket, who had my back, who stood there, and who eventually physically reached out and saved my life. And the other one, who stood on the sidelines and made a choice not to get to know me. And not only to not reach out, but to push me away. With that in my mind, I came to a realization of sorts that I had more choice in my life than I thought that I had. I got to choose which of these two guys I wanted to be most like when I left this place this time. And with that in mind, with that purpose, with that very vague idea, that's all that it really took to give me something to do with my life. It's not like everything changed overnight. I don't want to be Pollyannish with you. Recovery is weird. If you remember nothing else from this morning, it's that. That people recover in all kinds of different ways. But for me, finding that purpose, that meaning, was key. And it was enough that I went to my high school principal a few months later and I said, I want to open up about my experiences with groups of people because everybody found out about this anyway and some of them even told me that they had struggled too. But nobody was talking openly about it. I went to my high school principal and I said, I want to talk about suicide with my peers. And he said, no. <laughs> That's, you don't talk about suicide because give, if you talk about it, it gives people the idea to go out and do it. As though earlier that day, before I went to the bridge, somebody had said to me, hey, have you thought about killing yourself? And I said, no, but that's a great idea. Why don't I go do that? That's not how it works. I had been struggling for years. So, being the type of person that I still am, I was told no, I went home, I wrote my very first ever article uh, to the Cape Breton Post, our local newspaper. I know you're all subscribers. <laughs> I uh, likened the high, the high school administration to communist Russia for stifling my free speech. <laughs> And I asked why it wasn't okay to have honest, frank, real conversations about suicide when all of the research tells us that that is one of the single most powerful protective factors for saving people's lives, having these kinds of honest conversations, especially about recovery. And the next morning there were television news cameras in the <laughs> principal's office and an advocate was born, an antagonist was born. <laughs> Over the next 13 years of my life, that's how I lived my life. I went off to school, the first of my family to do so, because I wanted to understand more. I uh, had been doing more and more media, first with writing and then with television, until eventually I just found myself, I was right where I left me, it turns out, <laughs> and I had found myself on a stage here in Toronto for TED, that big red carpet that, that has become so famous. I told the story that I just told you. Suddenly, everybody wanted to share their story with me, too, and I felt like an imposter. Because I realized all in that moment, I have no idea if parts of my story are even true. I didn't know if this stranger in the light brown jacket was real. Because I had lived for more than a decade after that moment of never hearing or seeing about this guy again. Maybe I just made him up because I needed him. Maybe I made up this other guy on the sidelines because I needed a villain. An angel devil thing over my shoulders? Come on, that can't be real. So I decided that I needed to find out. In order to resolve this imposter syndrome inside me, I needed to find out. I developed great relationships with media, so I went to Canada, a producer at Canada AM, which was on at the time. I said, there's this guy in the light brown jacket who saved my life about 12 years ago. I know nothing else about him, but I want to find him. And I want the public's help in doing it. The producer said, cool. So they brought me on. Great relationship, good guy. And I told the story, part of that story on uh, morning television. In the car ride back to my apartment, this thing blows up viral all over the world, asking for the public's help on finding a stranger who saved my life 12 years ago. Within an hour, I started to get messages. One from his room, said he was his roommate at the time, that the stranger came home and told him about what happened. Another who said he was his brother-in-law, that they'd been sharing the story among the family ever since. His brother-in-law told me that the stranger had seen my TED talk, a week before I started to look for him, he started to write me a letter in case someday he ever found me. Because he didn't know if I had just gone back the next day and finished what I had started. They asked if they could send me the letter, I agreed, they did. 
sat in my inbox for about eight hours because I was suddenly terrified. What did I just get myself into? I'm going to have to rewrite my whole talk. This is a whole thing now. <laughs> but when I finally opened it, I clicked on the camera on my iPad because that's what normal people do at really vulnerable times in their life is they record themselves. So if, if you ever want to see a video of somebody really ugly crying for the whole world, you can look up this video. And in the very first line, he said, Hi, Mark. My name is Mike. And suddenly, the stranger in the light brown jacket had a name. And that might seem insignificant. But for me, it meant that he was real. And if he was real, maybe my story was real, too. We knew that we needed to meet. He had told me my whole story, but from a different camera angle. It was weird. <laughs> and had validated everything that I had told you today and everything that I doubted about myself inside. We knew we needed to meet, we flew him up to Toronto, put him up in a beautiful penthouse at the Shangri-La Hotel, because it turns out if you tell people a really great story, they just give you a bunch of free stuff. <laughs> so they put him up, we had brought cameras along with us, and as soon as he came up to me, we were down in Nathan Phillips Square, not far from here, I was up on top of the uh, canteen, the little terrace up there. As soon as he came up the stairs, he looked at me, and I didn't see him the first time, but I recognized him. Something in me recognized something in him. He was wearing a light brown jacket too, that bastard. That was definitely <laughs> intentional. <laughs> and the cameras were with us, so you can watch all this. He walked up the stairs, he didn't say a word, he looked in my eyes, I recognized something in him. He walked directly toward me and wrapped his arms around me just like he did that first time. I told him I had no idea how to thank him. How do you thank somebody for not just saving your life, but for giving you your whole life ever since? I had wanted to be like him. He'd been my role model for years, and I didn't even know who he was. So the best thing that I could do was to show him the life that he had given me. I introduced him to my wife. I introduced him to my then two-year-old little boy. I showed him where I worked. I talked to him about my pets, about my guitar, about all the things that he had talked to me about the last time we were together. All the things that I never would have believed that I'd someday have. But I do. And ladies and gentlemen, next time you're stuck, next time you're in a place where you feel like there's no other answers, I can promise you, it will pass. It will get better. Because this is not the end. Thank you. Thank you.